Blessings and grace from the Grace Community Church of the Nazarene, 100 Bull Run Road in Pennington, New Jersey, 08534. Glad that you could join us on YouTube and Facebook, on YouTube at gccnworship.org, and on our website at welcome, the number two, grace. And we want to welcome you today. We've been talking about Jesus after the resurrection and who he appeared to. And in the book of John, chapter 21, we continue Jesus' appearance to his disciples with this. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, said Peter. And they, the rest of the disciples said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. I don't know how it is with other people, but growing up at the shore, there's different kinds of fishing. Not just freshwater and saltwater, but there's the line guys and the net guys. The commercial guys use nets. Now the nets today, I have a friend who's a commercial fisherman. His net is about, a, about an eighth of a mile long. And what they do is they just bring it out. They have pilots to bring it out wide. They just draw it across and then slowly winch it in. Whatever fish they get land on the deck. They sort the good from the bad. Then there's the line guys. They're the ones that take their fishing rod. They go out offshore. I have a friend of mine who has a boat. And every so often they'll say, Pastor Will, you want to go fishing? And if I'm in the area, the answer is yes. The thing about it is lots of times we get scummed. Now, if you have a net, you're not going to probably get skunked, although there are times where you don't get the fish you want. But this kind of fishing, this was net fishing. And they went out. Peter says, Peter was a fisherman. James was a fisherman. John was a fisherman. I guess the other guys figured they could help. And they worked all night. Verse 4, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was him. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? And they answered, no. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It's the Lord, he wrapped his outer cloak around him, for he had taken it off. He jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, coals, and the fish were on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have that you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net had not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was how, now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. I want you to get the picture. Fishing with a net is best done at night. The reason is, most, time, most of us, we go out fishing in the day and we hope we get something. But fish like the shadows in the dark. In fact, if you can fish under a pier or under a bridge where there's a constant shadow, that is the best way to catch a fish. But if there's no, if you're in the middle of a lake, it's best to wait till dark. Well, what you do, you throw out your net, and normally there would be two boats, a big, a large boat and a smaller boat, kind of, kind of like a rowboat. And what they would do is they would hook the net out to the rowboat. He would row out in a, in a circle and have one edge of the net with him, 
And then when it got back to the large boat, he'd hand it off to the large boat, they would hook it in, and then they would slowly pull forward, and the net would collapse and catch anything that was in it. It's a very efficient way to fish. It's been done for thousands of years that way. And they fished all night. Now, the other thing that happens at night, when you're fishing at night, you can't really see what you're doing, so what do you do? You put on a light. Well, what happens is the fish are actually drawn to the light, whether they think it's moonlight or the sunlight. So you're setting the fish up to come to the light. The net comes around them in the darkness, and that's how they catch the fish. Now, it's hard work. Fishing nets, I don't care how old they are or how new they are, the new technology with, uh, with the finer fibers, but when it's an eighth of a mile long or when it's a hundred yards long, it's a heavy net. And pulling it in, back in biblical day, there was no electric or hydraulic winches or, you know, you didn't turn the generator on and just have it power up. You had to do it by hand. So they worked hard. So Peter took his outer coat off. He got hot and sweaty, very normal. They worked all night. And it gets to be daylight, they've worked all night, and they have no fish. Early in the morning, verse 4, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't recognize him. Now, there's three different thoughts on that. The easiest one was, he was 100 yards away. A lot of people can't really tell who you are. In the days before glasses, binoculars, telescopes, a hundred yards away, you weren't very tall, and everybody dressed kind of in the same clothes. The second thought is that there, because it was early morning, there could have been a mist on the lake, which kind of obscures details. If you've ever lived through a South Jersey fog, or even a Trenton fog, you'll understand what that's like. The third thing is, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus walked with the disciples and they didn't know who it was. He has the ability, because he's God, to reveal himself in his right time. Now, which one of those you go with really doesn't matter to the story. But there are those three, and I've heard people get upset when one person says one thing, one says the other. They're all viable. So he calls out to his, to his disciples. He knew, what, he knew them. He's God. He knew it was them. He knew he'd worked, they'd worked all night. And he calls out to them and he said, Hey guys, get any fish? Well, yesterday I had a chance to take my granddaughter fishing for the very first time. Five years old. Pops was Pops. He bought her a Barbie fishing rod that can't break. He went out and got her a frozen tackle box. She's thrilled. He put a little hook on her line, put a little bobber on it, put a worm on it. She liked the worm better than the fish. And she pulled in a fish. It was only this big. Just a, just a little sunfish. But to her, it was a whale. And she was starting to get bored until she caught this little fish. And then that made her day. Pops, can we take a picture? Pull out the phone, take the picture. And then she says, I'm ready to go home now. But here's what happens. When you're doing it for a living or you're doing it for the fun, I can tell you, I hate getting skunked. I hate going home with just lost bait. I don't care whether it's fresh water and I've drowned in a worm, or whether it's salt water and I've gotten some minnows, or as we say in South Jersey, minis. I hate going home without a fish. So I understand their frustration. They've worked all night, they're hot, they're sweaty, they're tired, they still have to bring the net in, they still have to wash it, because otherwise the, the water that's in it will rot the net, and then they have to do more work fixing it, and it's more money. So they still have a lot of work to do, and some guy on the shore goes, hey, caught anything? That's the, the chant of the fisherman. I don't care if you're fishing on the rock pile, by the stream, out in the boat, anybody comes near you, get any bites? And they have to admit, now, line fishermen, don't be mad at me if you're a line fisherman. But line fishermen, yeah, well, I had nibbles and they got away. <laughs> but in a net, you either have them or you don't. And they were honest. They said, no. 
He said, hey, throw your net on the other side of the boat. Think you can get something there. They threw the net in, did their little rotation and run. The net was so full that they couldn't bring it in. They couldn't pull it up on board. All night long, they'd been working nothing. Last cast of the day, they get so many fish that it makes up for the whole night. Then the disciple, verse 7, says, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, we all know who this disciple Jesus loved is, right? If you don't, I'm going to tell you. The disciple that Jesus loved was the disciple who rested his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. See, they ate lying down. They didn't eat sitting up or standing up. They laid down. It was John. John is traditionally thought to be the youngest. Son of Thunder... Now, when you're told that you're a son of thunder, chances are it's because you're a rough and tumble. Chances are it's because you don't take no for an answer. If he's a fisherman, he probably is. Most of those commercial fishermen guys, they brave the weather, they brave having good catches and bad catches, long hours, hardships. Most of them are a little bit on the rough and tumble side. When the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, he said, hey, Peter, I know who that is. That's Jesus the Lord. As soon as Peter heard it, now remember, Peter had some unfinished business because the last time he was with Jesus, before Jesus died, he denied him three times. And I know that played, in, I'm sure that played in his head. It was only, what, a couple weeks maybe? You don't forget things like that embarrassing things, things where you should have handled it better. And he jumps in. He, as soon as Simon Peter heard it, he says, I heard you say it's the Lord. Yeah, that makes sense. He puts his coat back on, wraps it around him, and jumps in the water. Kind of impetuous. Kind of, here we go again. If you remember the story right, Peter walked on water until he recognized how to. He says, I'm not going to let him know that I don't have faith this time. I'm going right in. And he's, and he's swimming to shore. The other disciples followed him in the small boat. Remember, the big boat, that had a couple of people in it. They're bringing the back side of the net in, and the little boat's pulling ahead. It's ringing it in and bringing it close. When they get there, Jesus has a fire of coals burning. I want you to think about that for a minute, because that's important. A lot of people put very little thing on it. But if you've ever camped, if you've ever been out in the woods, if you ever spend time barbecuing, you know that the first thing that happens is you get flames. Flames are good. Flames mean the fire has caught. Flames are not so hot. Flames don't hold heat. Flames have all the carbon and slip models. Coals happen after the flames. And what happens with the coals, you wait till the coals go because their heat is very even, very steady, but typically it takes about 40 minutes or more. So here Jesus is. These, he's looking out there. He knows it's his disciples. He knows they've been there all night. Why? Because he's God. And when they come in tired and defeated, the first thing he does is tell them how to be successful. Put the net on the other side of the boat. The second thing he tells them is, I've got you sustained. I've got you covered. See, we can do that with COVID virus. God will sustain us. Now, it doesn't mean everybody who gets COVID and is a Christian doesn't die. But what it means is we know where we're going. We know that we'll be healed either by earthly means and stay here, or by divine means and be with him. But it sometimes takes time. Jesus had it all planned out before they even knew what was going on. See, in the church, in the Nazarene church, we call that prevenient grace. God is putting things in front of us to draw, him, to draw us closer to him, even before we know we're looking for him. Somebody asked me, they said, what's the, what's the easy definition of prevenient grace? What would you tell a kid? And I say, easy. Before you even knew you were hiding, God was seeking. 
See, God was looking for you even before you knew that you were hiding. So he, they come in, they're tired, they're sweaty. They have this huge load of fish that now they've got to sort through before they take care of the nets. And he's got fish already there. Already cooking on coals. He's got bread already there. Already co mostly cooked. He says, hey guys, come on, get breakfast. I'm going to tell you, after a night of fishing, it doesn't matter what the, the, the meal is. If it's hot, it's good. But here's what happened. The other disciples followed, verse 8, in the boat, telling the net full of fish. For there were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw the fish go. And Jesus said, bring some of your fish, put them next to my catch. That's a little embarrassing if you think about it. Yeah, guys, I already got enough fish for breakfast, but you can put a couple years on. See, Jesus didn't want them to feel bad. Jesus didn't want them to feel like they were indebted because normally they would cook their own breakfast. Simon climbed aboard and he dragged the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153. Now, why 153? See, there's all kinds of people. Some people like numbers. Some people try and find meaning in numbers. You know, 666, the number 7, the number 3, how they go together. And people have, theologians, have discussed this and going around it ever since it was written down. Why 153? Now, the easiest method, if you like Occam's razor, all things being considered, the, the simplest answer is the best one. It's just a tally count. They pulled the fish. One, 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 this kind, this kind, this kind. And there were 153 fishes. Other people try and spiritualize it and say that it was Jesus foretelling what the miraculous gospel was going to do. It was finally open to 100% of the Gentiles, the remnant of the Jews, the ones who were looking for Messiah, and three for the Trinity. I don't know. Some people felt that the Greeks, and remember, the Romans and the Jewish people at that time loved the Greek models. They were following the Greek designs, clothing, styles. And the Greeks put an emphasis on 153 because the Greeks believed that there were only 153 types of fish. Now, some people have taken that and said, well, if they believe that there's 153 types of fish, that means that these disciples brought in every kind of fish available. Now, I'm not saying they're right or wrong. But what I'm saying is, it's an interesting idea of who Jesus wants to reach. Every type of people. Now, I know there's more than 153 countries and styles and all that. But it's, it could be symbolic of Jesus because remember Peter James and John he found them early on and how did he call them Do you remember he called them by saying I will make you fishers of men see he started his ministry telling them that they're going to fish for men and he ends this encounter after his resurrection before he goes to heaven and sends the Holy Spirit. But one of the last times he sees him, and he says, here's 153, all kinds of fish for all kinds of people you're going to fish for. And even with all these different kinds of fish, the net didn't break. Why? Because God's net is able to take everybody in the world inside his net. The little kid song. He's got the whole world in his hands. That's the symbolism here. I'm going to wrap you around. 
My granddaughter threw a hissy fit yesterday after fishing. She wanted her way and it wasn't going to happen and Pops got to play disciplinarian and she cried and cried and cried and cried and wouldn't do what she was told and she ended up in the corner. And when she finally complied, the first thing Pops did, that's me, Pops, I called her over, told her what was wrong, and then wrapped my arms around her and said, I always love you. See, that's what God says. He wants to wrap us all in his net and say, I, I love you. I always will love you. Jesus looked at him and said, hey guys, come on, have breakfast. See, remember, the food was ready. He just said, throw some more fish on. Basically, he was saying, I got you covered with what you need. But you got some extra fish? Throw them on. No, we'll have extras. See, it's not just about enough. It's about abundance with God. He is an abundant God. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him who he was. See, he, he still was the Peter, and John saw it. But the other disciples, they were still a little, who? See, one of the things that was said was John the Beloved recognized him first because when you're full of love, you see God in love. Love of God makes your vision clearer. That's pretty true. When you love God, you see people in a different way. Even the nasty people. Even the ugly people. Even those that you wouldn't really spend time with. But if you look at it through God's eyes, Jesus died on the cross for all the people, not just the pretty ones. And I'm glad for that. But the other disciples, they were afraid to ask. They thought they knew, but they weren't going to be embarrassed. They wanted to say, who are you? But they knew deep down it was the Lord. Verse 13, Jesus came, he took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it, he gave it to him. He took the fish. He handed it to him. See, some people try and make a, 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 a communion thing out of this. It's not a communion thing. It's just a common thing. I have this in common with my friends. Verse 14. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples. Now, for those of you who question Jesus and question his authority as God, and here's what I'm going to say to you. In the course of this time, between the time he resurrected and the time that he went back to heaven, he revealed himself to about 500 people. Now, I want you to think about this in a logical term. If somebody robbed a dozen banks and they had 500 witnesses to who it was, would any logical person say, no, I don't think it's him? Doesn't make sense, does it? But see, that's why we have to rely on faith. And that's why those who don't have faith don't understand. Because they somehow have their mind blinded that 500 witnesses isn't good enough. Jesus is good enough. He's abundant. And just when you think that you failed, worked all night, got no fish, he tells you how to get more. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Father God, Brother Jesus, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be with us during this COVID-19 thing. Lord, we know that it's looking kind of grim. The numbers aren't changing quickly enough. People are suffering. But Lord, you are a God of abundance. You've told us that if we humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, you'll hear from heaven, you'll forgive our sin, and heal our land. Lord, we ask that during this week that you would heal our country, heal this world of this virus. Lord, we ask that you would rectify our hearts help us to know like john even when you seem far off that it's the lord because lord we know that you've prepared abundance for us even before we recognize it lord we ask that you would be with each one of us let us show somebody 
our, our love for you by doing good for somebody else this week. Lord, maybe it's a card. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's doing shopping for a senior. Lord, whatever it may be, would you lift us up to where we help lift others? Help us to be fishers of men. We ask this in your holy and precious name, saying thank you for your good gifts. 